Hello and welcome to this new landscape tutorial. Uh, today we'll be taking a look on how to create a sort of large-scale render. I've seen these quite often lately, um, where there's like a sci-fi city or something that's like super huge. And I think for somebody that's maybe a bit more new to 3D and stuff, it could be an interesting video um, that explains a bit on how to approach a render like this. So this is a render I've been working on. It's uh, It's actually very simple and I think it's great for explaining uh, important things when you're making like a large scale render. So yeah, this is for a comic I've been working on. Uh, so yeah, I didn't have a lot of time to work on this. I think I spent like five hours on this, but even in five hours you can make something that looks decent. And yeah, uh, so I will be showing the 3D file, but before that, um, I just wanna talk about some key points. So I think the first most important thing when you're making a large scale render, like something that's supposed to feel massive, is the scaling, obviously. So I don't need to explain what makes scaling. I think we all sort of know. So you kind of need small and larger objects. You need like a reference for the scaling. So obviously you need something that tells you this is the small, like this is small and this is big. So and if we look at this render, the most obvious thing is probably the lamps. Um, it's a very iconic object because you know what it is. Uh, I'd say most humans know what a lamp is and it immediately tells you, well, you immediately know how big it is and it just tells you how large the scene is that we are looking at. And especially because we have the spacing here that is not that affected by the perspective, but then we see sort of how small the distance gets and sort of we get a feeling for how long this huge bridges. So yeah, when you're doing a large-scale render, it's important to have contrast between smaller and larger shapes. And this might sound very obvious, but I feel like um, you could maybe forget about that if you're a bit new to this. Um, and sometimes environments aren't like that obvious. Like this is kind of like a city and cities come with structures that already establish the sizing because you already, because you always have lamps in the city and buildings. And that sort of already establishes the sizing. But maybe you're doing a completely different type of environment that doesn't have uh, buildings or stuff like that. So you need to think about what to place uh, in order to get that correct feeling for the size. If it's like a field, it could be trees in the distance that just show how large your plane is. And, or it could be clouds, um, like a sea of clouds that really shows the depth of your like render. And yeah, that's just an important thing. Uh, I'd say another object that really helps are the windows because windows are pretty iconic too. You immediately recognize them and you see how large they are. And they're like, they're like, there's like lots of windows here and they also like disappear or like merge into the distance. So you, that also like really helps with the feeling of the scale. Also the lamps here, obviously. And I'd say the platings, like the grunge details help as well. Uh, it would probably still work with like large plates, but it's still kind of important because you have these large gaps here. And on top of these plates are like all these smaller details um, that sort of sell the whole body, like the whole bridge here, because it's been kind of like scrapped together with lots of metal plates. And yeah, the, you just kind of need a balance between smaller and larger objects and sort of have a gradient from small to large. Um, so if we look at the blocking, the very first blocking I did, which looks completely garbage, um, we can see it obviously doesn't work that well. We have a mountain and we have the lights, which kind of give, give us a clue on how big this might be. But the bridge itself is just flat and you immediately see it like you, you need lots of detail just to tell how big this object really is. And yeah, if we compare it with this again, it's night and day, obviously. So another thing that I feel like is important, uh, which doesn't directly transfer to the sizing uh, of anything, but more of the readability. And I think when you're making a large scale render, it's very easy to overcrowd your uh, environment and sort of make it hard to read. Because if, because if you're making an environment, you obviously want to tell some type of story. You want to explain what this is. So with this render, I wanted to go with like an industry type of area 
um, that just seems inhumane because I mean there's like a lack of colors there's like this fog that looks kind of toxic um, just things like that and with readability I mean mainly the silhouettes and just the readability of the shapes because in order for this to sell as an industry type of area you would need shapes that express that and for me that were the pipes pipes and sort of metallic structures and you sort of have this silhouette that's very easy to read and you immediately understand what type of area this is like if you if you see the image for the first time you immediately see these pipes and you like understand okay this is sort of like an industry uh, area it's like an industrial area where people work um, you could probably make this even more dramatic if you made like small, uh, if you made like uh, fog, uh, or like smoke that comes out. But yeah, make sure to not overcrowd your city or whatever with assets. Uh, it's very easy to get lost in that because scattering stuff with assets is super easy, and you might overdo it, and your render might suffer from that. Um, so yeah, let's hop into the three D. Uh, the three D isn't anything special at all, so this part will be super quick. Uh, if you're more new to 3D, um, you can definitely do something like this very, very quickly, very early on, I'd say. Um, so I used uh, GeoScatter. This is not sponsored, but I use GeoScatter a lot for my work and also for commercial work. And here it was just perfect to use GeoScatter. Um, it's basically an add-on that lets you scatter assets. And you can use the Blender emitter for something simple like this as well, but GeoScatter also comes with lots of free packages which is super nice and here I used like a free industrial asset pack uh, which is just great so I can e recommend this add-on for anybody even if you're just like a hobby artist um, so yeah the way I did the scattering is just by making a few strips because I didn't want to scatter on the whole plane uh, because it wasn't necessary if we hop into the camera this isn't necessary at all what was important though is that we have a bit of depth so I made like a few strips uh, that were spaced out just to get like a feeling of depth kind of so it feels like the whole plane is scattered because if we look at the camera uh, it looks like that because this is like the furthest away strip and it gives like the feeling of depth without scattering on the whole surface um, which might actually not be that great anyways if we did that because it might get too overcrowded like if we had the same scattering density on this whole plane uh, it would probably be too crowded and so this was the easiest way to do this and probably the most interesting thing are the plates um, I used random flow for this which is also a paid add-on but I think it's like 15 bucks or something and it's super great if you're specifically uh, in need of like these random scattered plates um, so if we turn those off for a sec, we see I basically just modeled a simple cube into this shape. It's super easy to do. To firstly explain random flow, random flow takes a mesh and you can sort of split up your mesh or you can spawn plates on top of your mesh based on the topology of that said mesh. Um, so if you wanted to have a super large bridge like this and sort of scatter plates on this, you wouldn't have this be one mesh that you added. So the way I did it is... I didn't make one big mesh because if you do one big mesh and like subdivide it a thousand times and then you use random flow, uh, it's just gonna crash probably. So a more PC friendly solution is by just making one section um, and then just using a ray to like clone it. So I made one section and then I split that section up again into multiple plates. And then I did the first sort of layer of platings which are a bit larger and then I split these up again into smaller sections and I subdivided these again and then I made the second layer basically which gives us even more details and you could have definitely added even another layer but I didn't want to it wasn't necessary for me um, but yeah, the thing with random flow, I mean, it pretty much does everything for you. You, ju you just kind of have to figure out the style you want to go for. So here I made the topology of the mesh more like uh, stretched so that when I cut it up, the plates are like more lo like longer and not just perfect squares because I felt like that looked cool. 
and I did the exact same process for the feet, or like the pillars. But here I didn't go for the same style because I've... It's like kind of also shape language, right? Because the pillars are stationary and um, like they hold the entire civilization kind of on this bridge. Um, so I wanted to go with something more neutral and like static, which is just very simple cubic shapes. Um, if you make a shape like this, like very stretched, it feels kind of in motion, which made sense to me because there's like trains and everything is like happening here and like going back and forth. So it made sense to have the shape language like that. But for the pillars, they don't move, they are stationary, people live in here, everything, like everything is in here and it's very static. So um, I just kept the shapes like very simple and squarish. Okay, here we are in After Effects now. I'm gonna go through the compositing part of this project. Uh, if you just were here for the 3D advice, um, you can just pack your things. Um, but if you're also interested in the post-process of this image, then definitely stay. So this is the raw render. Um, and it kind of exposes me here, to be honest. I'm like a 3D fraud with this project. Um, it looks absolutely horrible. The raw render is super bad. And I was aware of that, obviously. But since this is more like a hobby project, uh, I didn't want to spend too much time on this. So I just rendered it and I was like, yeah, the lighting is bad, but I can probably fix this in post with a few effects. And you can see the setup isn't complex at all. It has some super simple effects. Um, but yeah, this just goes to show, and this is kind of horrible advice, but it just goes to show you don't always need to go the extra mile. For, com for commercial projects, definitely always go the extra mile. Um, but for hobby projects, you might not need to do it. So we have this very bad render here and I started out with a detail layer. It's just an adjustment layer with the BCC detail effect, which is great to be honest. It's kind of a really good plugin for a case like this. So if you're doing like large scale renders, I'd have like these sci-fi details. This add-on could really like bring out more and it's kind of just like a simple curves or like a levels effect. It increases the contrast, it pushes like the highlights, um, but it does it very specifically. It's not just like a levels uh, layer, right? Um, so you can see the difference here. It pushes like the contrast, it brings out like the details, but it does it without, um, like it isn't just a simple contrast. If this were just a simple contrast, um, it would crush all the darks, but here it kind of adjusts the contrast, but it also pushes the highlights, but it also pushes the darks very nicely. So we get that, that like grungy detail here. And I really didn't do much. Like I just, you can set the values here, like coarse, medium and fine. And that's about it. And it's really great. And yeah, I, I just mask it because I didn't want this effect to be applied to everything. And I really like how it pushes like how it improves this section here by a lot so yeah this is a cool effect um so the next effect is a bit weird it might sound a bit counterintuitive so i'm like blurring the image and then sharpening it again um, i've mainly been doing this for my characters because they are very like stylized and i think 3d on characters like stylized characters tends to look too sharp and perfect so by blurring the whole image and then sharpening it again, we are kind of making it a bit softer, um, but it doesn't look like you're just like blurring it. It, ju it just sort of blurs the edges sort of, and it looks a bit more natural and it doesn't have like that perfect 3D look anymore. And I used it here as well because I think it really improves the faraway details that are already like a bit blurred to begin with. Um, so if we turn this off, this is very crisp and like super detailed. But I feel like by blurring and sharpening it, it gives the it gives it that sort of like when you look at an old TV and things are maybe a bit too sharpened and look just a bit weird. I feel like it gives it that kind of vibe, and I really like that because it looks a bit grungier. Um, just as a reference, without the sharpen, it would look like this. So yeah, I, I really like the effect. Um, then I just added a. Uh, emission layer where I render with EXR multi-layer and then I just added like the uh, emission pass and blurred it a bit and here I just added a drawn layer to darken the areas here a bit because I just wanted to do that and yeah then just 
a very very slight curve to just brighten it up a bit and then some chromatic aberration here and then I added some grain because I felt like the areas here could use that yeah and then I just added a simple background um, with some drawn clouds and they blend very well with my volumetric clouds that I had in Blender and I kind of try to have like a vignette sort of on this image. If you were to take a circle, the circle tool and sort of try it like this. This is sort of what I was going for. To have like the focus sort of here. I didn't want it. I didn't want the focus to be like super obviously stylized on top of the mountain. Like have a vignette completely focused on a mountain, um, but sort of in that direction. Uh, so that the image, you get like the feel from left to right, because if this area were a lot brighter and didn't have like that vignette, I think the effect would be not so great, because here we really have that from left to right effect. Everything pushes sort of to the right side. Um, yeah, it just feels a bit more dramatic. And we kind of understand that the story will draw towards this direction, right? Um, yeah, I mean, this is the After Effects setup. It's super simple. I explained this in six minutes. And yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.